Hi there. We're on the ninth session of the Brain Power series. And I'm sure that you have learned a lot with me as we have gone through the principles of how to improve your brain power. We've looked at 10 times wiser, the real mind, uh, the muddled mind, also the, the power of crisis, um, the power crisis that we have sometimes in our brains, and then the power supply to the brain. We also looked at shaping your thoughts. That's the EFAs, the essential fatty acids. We looked at good cop, bad cop, you know, the, the omega-3 and 6 um, uh, challenge. And then we've looked at your brain satisfaction or slavery. In this session, uh, we're going to look at uh, your brain or belly. It is really your choice. Recapping our last one, uh, you know, we all know that caffeine is a stimulant. We, we do recognize that sugar is a stimulant. But we don't always realize that even refined salts could be a stimulant. The reason is the, the uh, refining process of, of, of salt. Salt normally would form little crystals and it becomes a little bit uncontrollable, especially when there's moist involved. And this is why they are in, in manufacturing, they would uh, heat the salt up to about 1200 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and fuse it to aluminum particles to make it flow all the time. This is really a, a big problem because salt in its natural form would actually have 96 very important nutritional elements to it, where in this refining process, it cuts it down to maybe two or three elements. The basic um, challenge here is that refined salt, iodized salt, is not the best for us. We should rather go for the unrefined sea salt or um, the Himalayan rock salts. That would uh, give us back those elements that we very, very badly need in our system. Now, we also looked at the anatomy of a habit. And uh, this picture, we're going to look at this in this um, episode. and the next episode, we'll look at it again. But this whole thing of a habit starting with a thought, it filtering through principle, either principle or feeling, leading to an action, and that action will give me a feeling. That's the response of okay or not okay. Habits could be changed, it could be broken by intercepting 23 times with another habit and that becoming the, the dominant one. I want to remind us that your habits, the way you do things and what you do, form your character. Your character is the only thing that we could take to heaven. Now, this brought us to a pain-pleasure principle. And uh, we found that the most two common pleasure-driven habits that becomes addictive and leads to major disorders are appetite, number one, and number two, sex. Now, both have a major impact on our brain health. And you could, and could, could make the difference between you flying or you scratching like a chicken. I don't know about you. But by now, I'm really determined. I want to fly. I would not like to scratch like a chicken. Brain facts that we need to know, and this one you might have seen before, a study of one million students in New York uh, showed that students who ate lunches that did not include artificial flavors, preservatives, and dyes did 14% better in IQ levels than the, than the students who ate lunches with these um, additives to, to the food. Really, really important that we uh, look at what we eat. Our brains is as good as we feed it. It's not about how many memory you've got. It's not how many RAM you have that work. Really, it's about how we care about our brain. Um, it's not that we don't, that somebody that's more intelligent have more brain cells. That's really not true. It's about the connections that we have. And those connections 
are really compromised by what we feed our brain, the most sensitive organ in our bodies. Here's another little uh, fact that you might not know. New neurons in, neuron, uh, in, in humans, humans continue to make new neurons throughout their life in response to mental activity. We sometimes think, no, we've got that and that's it. But we form new connections, all neuro connections, all the time throughout our life. Every activity that we do, we build new ones. Our brains are not stagnant. It's just changing all the time as we allow it to change. And this is why it's so great to know God has created us in a way that it doesn't matter what we've done in the past. God can help us to change into something new by relaying these neuron neuro pathways. Now, let's look specifically at your brain or your belly. You see, this is the choice we have to make. What is the most important? Is it my brain or is it my belly? And sometimes, you know, belly takes the preference. We, uh, we don't realize what we do to our brains. A verse that, um, that we need to work into this whole uh, diagram of habits is found in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 19 and verse 20. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This text means a lot to me when I especially hear people saying, when we talk about appetite, when you talk about the belly thing, they say, I can do what I want. It's my body. I can eat what I want. It's my body. I can make the decision. This verse is very clear. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So whatever we do, do glorify God with our bodies. I believe that means with our minds, with what we do. Let's glorify Him. Well, brain and belly. You see, uh, Eating is one of those most pleasurable, pleasurable, sensible little things that we can do. The question is, the eating habit, is it good or is it bad? Well, immediately I get a reaction from all my audience. They say, well, it's good. You know, uh, it's so good to me. I do it twice a day. Twice a day I eat. I sit and I eat because I enjoy it so much. Every time I eat, I think about how grateful I am to, to be able to, to eat, that God gave me this uh, beautiful food, this delicious food to eat. We also need to know that it's, it perpetuates one's life. Oh, we need to eat. You need to eat to stay alive. It's really a habit that we should have and really does a big difference. Now, let's look at a natural eating syndrome. There's certain uh, syndromes that we need to really clarify and know well. Let's look at the natural eating syndrome. We have said, and we've learned in the episodes before, that a stimuli always leads to a response. Well, let's look at the stimuli and how it leads to a response and what the outcome would be here. Well, some of the stimuli that we would have with natural eating is smelling or sight. Those are, are the most predominant ones. You know, when I see good food, you know, really look at this beautiful decoration. Fruits and whole grains. It does something to me. You know, the, the, the saliva starts building up in my, in my mouth. When I walk into a kitchen and I start smelling that good food, you know, onions being fried. Wow, you know, something happens. It leads to an action. There's saliva, there's anticipation. Wow, uh, it's going to be good, it's going to be great. And then, you know, one tends to feel hungry. Y y you just start feeling hungry. This is the reaction. It, it's normal, it's the syndrome. It, it, it goes this way. And then we go and eat. And how do you feel after you've eaten? Remember, it's natural, we need to eat. It smelled good. It looked good. 
Saliva was there. It, it needs to be there. I felt hungry. I eat. And I, the response is, I feel satisfied. I feel good. This is natural. It should be like that. Well, let's look at an unnatural condition syndrome. And where are we going to look at some research? Uh, we're going to look at Pavlov's dogs. This uh, scientist took some, some dogs and he started training them. And uh, they learned certain stimuli. And that led to a response. So the stimuli that was there, every time that Pavlov and his servants fed the dogs, they rang a bell. So every time they served a meal, they rang a bell. And the next day it happened, and the next day, and the next day, and for a while, every time they gave them their, their bowl of food, they rang a bell. Well, this is what happened. Every time there was saliva dripping when they heard the bell. One day, the bell was ringing, but there was no food given to the dogs. The saliva were dripping. The, there was wagging tails, anticipation for this food that's going to come, but there was no food. They felt hungry, but there's no food. And when there was no food, what was the response? It was frustration. These dogs got very frustrated. So much so, it's good that Pavlov wasn't around because his servants nearly lost their lives. They had to climb on roofs and stuff to get away because the dogs wanted to eat them. They heard this bells going. There was no food and now they were frustrated they wanted food. Well, we see a similar situation in, in human unnatural eating syndrome. And uh, this is something that we really have to zone in in the session. Well, once again, there's a lot of stimuli when it comes to eating. But, and that also leads to a response. Now, the response could be a feeling of okay or it could be a feeling of not okay. And that would mean this habit is a bad habit or a good habit. Now, you know, stimuli could make a difference. Response could make a difference. Well, look at this. In this diagram, we see, looking at the unnatural eating syndrome, there's not only sight and smells and even texture, feeling that could, you know, trigger us to really get to a response when it comes to eating. There's things like, and we associate these with, with our eating, uh, things like social events, things like fantasy, things like TV, even boredom, you know, worries could, could be stimuli. Some people cannot drive their cars if they don't eat. Some people cannot watch TV if they don't eat. Or they can't eat if they don't watch TV. So you would go and sit in front of the TV and that would be the stimuli. That would lead you to saliva dripping and anticipation. I need something to eat. But now it might not be mealtime. It might be late in the evening. But the fact is, you know, there is a hunger sensation, but it's mostly because of conditioning. You have conditioned your system that in front of the TV, I need to have something to eat. Saliva will start dripping and there will be a simul assimilation of hungerness. I would eat, but the fact is it's not meal time. I should actually not eat at that time. It leads to a response where I feel frustrated. Many people eat at this juncture and they are frustrated with themselves because they want to lose weight. They want to be more healthy, but now they've eaten at a time they shouldn't have and the response is frustration. And what we do find now is that people now start punishing themselves because of this. And this is a real bad cycle this unnatural eating syndrome. Because in that punishment, we will now get to ourselves. Some people go to gluttony. Others would go in a, and start in a process and an eating disorder of anorexia or bulimia. Some people would just, you know, be 
eating and eating and eating, binging, and then go and stick their finger in their throat and get rid of it and try and have that response of it's okay. Because they feel frustrated, because they are not happy with the outcome. And this cycle, vicious cycle, just goes on and goes on and goes on. Um, I, want to, I want to give you one example, very interesting example. I visited a friend, um, not because I had to necessarily visit him, but um, we, 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 we went jointly to a meeting. I flew to his house. Uh, staying quite away from where we stay, spend the night there. The next morning, his wife gave us a scrumptious breakfast. Wow, it was so great. I ate, I felt satisfied, and I knew the program of the day. We would have left, gone on the highway, get to our meeting place. Hour and a half later, we would have been in meetings. They would serve us with the lunch. We will drive back late in the afternoon. We'll be back. The next morning, I will be flying back home so the morning we had this good breakfast and when we got to the driveway i know we have to turn right to go to the highway and get on our way to our meeting instead of going right he went left and uh, asked you know what, what what are we doing he said no we need to get something for the road and uh, so he, he, he turned left and he went to the supermarket and uh, i i I suggested I stay and look after the computers in the car, and he left, and he came back with a bag of, of little things. Now, while sitting there in the car, looking around, I realized when he opened the bag, that is not what he normally buys when he's driving his car. There was little, there was little uh, papers lying around, all, but now in the bag, he had some dried fruits, and he had some raisins, and he had some nuts and you know all of those healthy things and he started opening up the packets now you, you guys need to realize i am really satisfied uh, we've had a good scrumptious breakfast and i don't need anything else until hours later he opened the packets and he offered and i said thanks man i had a good breakfast he could not understand he was uh, he had a good breakfast too he, he was eating all the way, and as he drove, he ate some more, and we spoke. And nearly all the way, he was eating there. Hour and a half drive, he was eating and using all of these packets. And uh, we got there. We had our meetings. We had lunch, tea breaks. I have my juices and all that. He had still a little cake here and whatever they offered and lunch. And then we came back, and I was amazed. On the road back, we started talking about this because he was, he was questioning, how come you have not had anything? I said, well, the principle is I eat at mealtime. I don't eat anything between mealtimes. Well, you know, when I'm driving, I like eating. And here it came out. He didn't need to eat. It was the emotion that told him he must eat while he's driving. So while he's driving, he must eat. It is... A stimuli that really leads to an unnatural eating syndrome, leaving us with a lot of problems. If you can just go back to those episodes that we looked previously and be reminded of what happens when we eat in between meals. It really causes a big crash in our, in our digestive system. There's some reasons why people eat emotionally. And let's just pick up on some of them. Some people eat because of dependency. Um, they depend on somebody or something, and, and, and they would eat to, to really just cover up that, um, that, 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 that feeling. Some eat because of fear. So, so they, they're fearful of something. It might be a test or something, and they, they would now binge a little bit to calm the motion. You know, it's, it's, it's something that they've been taught or stimulated with that, yeah, it will calm you down if you eat. Well, it's not, it's not true. Uh, some people, when they're angry, then they eat. Uh, or they have a, you know, a, a desire to take revenge, then, then they eat. And they would eat really very stimulating things. Some people desire, have a desire for protection or, um, or a perfection, I mean, or, or achievement. 
and they would eat, you know, to, to help them to stay on top of things. Um, emotional isolation is another reason why people um, eat emotionally. Depression. People get in a state of depression. They would eat. Others would stop eating. We're talking here about eating disorders that really are getting more and more common in, in every day's life. Even young people are getting tied up with these sort of things. There's a very interesting little principle that I share with people. It's called HALT. And uh, this is the conditions under which you will not eat, refrain from eating, is the principle, HALT principle. The H stands for hungry. And I can just imagine you looking at this program and you're saying to yourself, you're crazy. How can you say I shouldn't eat when I'm hungry? Well, it's a principle. The principle says you eat at meal time. Have set meal times. It could be 8 o'clock and 1 o'clock, but that's the time you eat. It could be one, once again 5 or 6 o'clock, but that's the time you eat. Don't eat in between meals. Never eat when you're hungry. Eat at meal time. The second principle is angry. Halt A in the halt is angry. Never eat when you're angry. Never eat when you're lonely. We teach old people, rather share your food with your neighbor. Do something together, but don't sit lonely and just eat because you're lonely. Don't do that. Don't eat when you're lonely. Get somebody in fellowship and you'll do much better. Don't eat when you're tired. If you're tired, refrain from eating. You would do your digestive system and your brain at the end of the day a big favor if you would go for this. I want to share a few statements with you out of a very, very interesting little book. It's called Mind, Character and Personality. And this is the second volume, page 391. We spoke about sugar as a stimulant. Look at this statement. Sugar is not good for the tummy. It causes fermentation. And this clouds the brain and brings peevishness into disposition. I tell you, I know what it is to have a clouded brain. I really don't want a clouded brain. I want to the, be the best for God. I want to fly. I'm going to avoid those things that would cloud my brain, that would bring peevishness. That means that would bring weakness in the system. I would rather stay away from that. And it has been proved that two meals are better than three for the health of the system. This is why I'm on a two meals a diet for the last 15 years. I see it proven that one has just more endurance, more brain energy, more concentration, better memory. Another, another statement in the second paragraph. It is not the physical health alone that is injured by pork eating. The mind is affected and the finer sensibilities are blunted by the use of this gross article. It's not called food, it's a gross article. Here's another one, page 387, that says overeating and even the most wholesome food is to be guarded against. This is a big problem. Some people go to gluttony. Nature can use no more than is required for the building up various organs of the body and excess clogs the system. It clogs my brain. I don't need it. I need a, a, a sharp mind. Many a student is supposed to have broken down from overstudy when the real cause was overeating. While proper attention is given to the laws of health, there is a little danger from mental taxation. But in many cases of so-called mental failure, it is the overcrowding of the tummy that wearies the body and weakens the mind. I love to have a fresh, open mind. If I avoid these circumstances, I could have a brilliant mind. God wants me to have that. Councils on Diet, another very interesting little book. I'm reading from page 53, paragraph 2. What a pity. It is that often, when the greatest self-denial should be exercised, the tummy is crowded with a mass of unhealthy food which lies there to decompose. The affliction of the tummy affects the brain. 
I'm going to look after my tummy because I want a sharp brain. The imprudent eater does not realize that he is disqualifying himself for giving wise counsel. Disqualifying himself for laying plans for the best advancement of the work of God. He cannot discern spiritual. I would never want to be in this position. He cannot discern spiritual things. And in council meetings, when he should say, Yay, Amen, he says, Nay. He makes propositions that are wide of the mark. The food he has eaten has benumbed his brain power. Let's make good decisions. We should not get there. We should not get there. I want to remind you of um, a very interesting little verse that we find in Philippians 4 verse 13 that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Even in the worst conditions, even with eating, because we don't want to touch the plate. We don't want, don't touch my plate. We can make changes with God that strengthens us. And that brings me to the last verse in this, um, in this episode. Isaiah, and we go there to chapter 55 verse 2. That says, why spend money on what is not bread? What's not real quality food? And you labor on what does not satisfy. Really, we work our backsides off every day. To have money to buy the food. And then this verse says, you work for really what not satisfy. You spend money on this food that really is not bread. That's not good food. And then look at this. Listen. Listen to me. There's that exclamation. Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. May God bless you as, you as you make good decisions for Him. May you work for what is food that would really satisfy you. Until our next episode, keep strong, keep healthy, make good decisions. See you then.